Hello, BookTube. Well, it's the 1st of April, and that means the beginning of many BookTube events, including people in April, which none dare call people. <laughs> this is hosted by Roz at Scaly Dandling About the Books and Elizabeth at Bookends and Books, and it's all about life writing. Any kind of life writing. Memoirs, uh, uh, autobiographies, uh, or full, full dress biographies, just uh, any anything like that. I'm a little bit Thanks to my brattle shopping this morning, I'm a little bit vague on whether or not letter collections fall under that umbrella, or maybe they're just on the periphery of it. Uh, but those things certainly do. A biography is my favorite thing to read. I, I'm all for reading extra biographies in April and talking about them extra amounts for people in April. <laughs> but before we go into specifics of actual biographies, rundowns, top tens, uh, more TBR stuff. Before we get into that, I thought we'd talk about biographies just in general. Uh, and here we can we can talk about biographies mainly, but memoirs will also count for this discussion, because uh, there are basically four descriptive categories that will apply to biographies when you're reading them. Uh, and I, in order to make things easier, I drew up a handy graphic for you, because these things are going to work on two axes, how accurate they are, and how interesting they are. And unfortunately, as you can see from the graphic, accurate but boring is by far the biggest part of, of the biography publishing ecosystem. By far the biggest. Uh, so let's finish up there and start elsewhere. So we'll start with a smaller sliver on the side, which is accurate but interesting. And this is where the author has uh, told the truth, hewn to the facts as they are known, but done so with a, a great deal of storytelling energy. Uh, this will be slightly vulnerable to shifts in caches of documentary information, but not as vulnerable as most people think. Uh, whether or not a new archive are, is un, is you know, opened to the West that deals with Trotsky. The fact that a new Trotsky archive is unveiled to the West does not automatically invalidate the interesting part of all other Trotsky biographies. And the current thinking in biographical circles, especially academic biographical circles, which we'll come back to, uh, says that that, that, that that is true. That the minute new information exists about anyone, all previous biographies that did not have access to that information are not only invalidated, but worthless. That's a dumb way to think. I'm hoping that not many people think that way uh, that, that are connected with BookTube. Uh, because, it, as we're going to see, uh, one can hope that a lot more goes into writing a biography than that. Than just, do you have the access to the latest archives? The interesting, uh, the uh, accurate and interesting arm of biography reading is, of course, the pinnacle. It's what you want the most. Uh, these will be typically the best biographies because you won't have to know what the author doesn't know, and you'll never be bored, which is great. Then we have uh, the bottom uh, sections here, if you can make them out. Uh, the bigger one, by far, is inaccurate and boring. <laughs> and this will be uh, all the books that are written with agendas. Now, every biography that's ever written has at least the ghost of an agenda because the biographer had to find the subject interesting to start with, or they wouldn't have written the book. So that is that is an angle, anyway. I have read plenty of biographies by biographers who did find the subject interesting when they started. Then they're a year into their contract. They hate their subject. They, their opinion has definitely changed, but they can't get out of the contract. They've already spent it, so they've just got to push through. But... Uh, Usually, the, the agenda of the biographer finding the subject interesting enough to start the project in the first place is about as far as you want to go with agenda before it compromises the whole thing. Anything more than that, and you are reading something that is inaccurate and boring. These are all political memoirs, all political lives of any kind. These are non-biographers writing about figures whose corpses they can reanimate in order to push their own contemporary agenda. So if you get a politician writing about Russell Kirk, or writing about FDR, or writing about Herbert Hoover, or writing God help us about Abraham Lincoln, if you get someone 
doing that, well, they're going to have a terrified underling do a, a small smattering of bad research. And then they're just going to slap an agenda on the thing. So it's going to be both inaccurate and boring. Uh, unfortunately, this also applies to uh, a whole bunch of other kinds of biographies that can often be popular. Scandal biographies, for instance, the Kitty Kelly school of biography, where the goal is to titillate and to beat your competitors to the market. Those also will be inaccurate and boring. So does the biographer have an agenda? Are they only using their subject in order to get that agenda across to you? That boy, oh boy, America used to be better. Or boy, oh boy, Americans used to be tougher. Or whatever that is. Or whatever nationality it is. I'm sure you know the kind of book I'm talking about. Those manage to be both inaccurate and boring. <laughs> and then on the bottom here also, there is a slot for inaccurate but interesting. <laughs> I think James Lee Milne came up just the other day on this channel, but there are all sorts of examples like this where the person is writing a memoir or they're writing a biography and maybe they're not doing all that much research, but they sure, they don't have a browbeating agenda and they sure are interesting. So you take a celebrity biographer, someone who is not, you're not expecting them to be spending 10 hours a day in the Rose Reading Room of the, of the New York Public Library. So you get What's an example? Uh, Edith Sitwell. You get, or Nancy Mitford. You get Nancy Mitford to, re to write a biography of the Sun King. <laughs> Nancy Mitford, last time I knew, could not handle the French in the archives uh, and wouldn't be caught dead in the archives anyway. So, but she's Nancy Mitford. See what I mean? It, it's going to be inaccurate, but entertaining. It's going to be interesting. Same thing with uh, Patrick Lee Farmer. Uh, blessed be his name. Don't get me wrong. I love his books. They aren't accurate. <laughs> they aren't. They aren't accurate to what really happened. You wouldn't want them to be. They're so good that it, it doesn't matter. Or Louis Auchincloss writing a, a quick book about Edith Wharton. You could say that that was agenda driven because he was mainly meaning to do exactly what her own agenda was in so much of what she wrote, which was to capture the essence of a vanished New York that he misses and wishes were back. That infuses his book about Edith Wharton, and his book about Edith Wharton is wonderful, but <laughs> it's not exactly it's not exactly nailed down accuracy. It's not like he was spending hours and hours in the Rose Reading Room. Uh, and then we come all the way around to this biggest section, which is accurate and boring, uh, where the person is a professional biographer, or God help us, an academic biographer. And they have researched their subject to a fairly well. They've had a grant or maybe three grants. They have carefully plotted it out. They used to have a big box full of index cards. Now I imagine they have files on their, on their laptop. And when they're at the end of that process, whoever they are, they think that the sum total of their obligation is to back that dump truck up and show up on the page with all of that research. Here you go. Here's all of my research. Here's what happened and exactly when it happened and exactly where. And this is how I know that. Uh, a whole bunch of professional biographers think that's their job. Almost all the academic biographers that I've ever read think that's their job. That is not their job. If you have written a boring book, you have written a failure. Your book is bad. <laughs> no, matter, no matter how accurate it is. If it's boring, it's bad. Uh, you have to remember to tell the story. Otherwise, all the research in the world isn't going to save you. It, your book might still be useful. Certainly, it might still be useful. I have read uh, multi-volume academic biographies tend to be to fall prey to this most visibly. I have read many of those that were unbelievably boring, but very useful because the author really has done every last bit of work. So... You, you'll always have that. You'll have that work to refer to. I hate to say it, but even high, some high-profile multi-volume biographies are that way. There is a famous bio, multi-volume biography in Maryland in Modern Times of Dostoevsky. It's grueling to read. It's not grueling to read because Dostoevsky's life was grueling. It's grueling to read because the author forgot to entertain. Or, worse yet, thought that he didn't need to. <laughs> that it wasn't part of his job. 
Uh, whereas a recent multi-volume biography of both Herman Melville and Charles Darwin don't forget that. Uh, uh, <laughs> and the examples go on and on. Some of them are heartbreaking. There's, there was a multi-volume biography of the author Graham Greene, for instance. That is the final word on everything that Graham Greene thought or wrote or jotted down on a napkin or had for lunch or told to anybody anywhere, including random cab drivers. But the whole thing is stultifyingly dull. And that's not an accident. I guarantee you that the author of those green volumes thought, I'm doing all I need to do. I'm here, aren't I? <laughs> Here's all my research. Has anyone ever done more research than this on the subject? No. So what, do you expect me to tap dance for you? But the answer to that, darling, is yes, I do expect you to tap dance for me. A boring book is a bad book. And if you have the nerve to say, as a one author of a multi-volume biography of a certain figure did say, that it's not possible to do that over multiple volumes, <laughs> well, you shouldn't say it to me. If you feel like saying that, you shouldn't say it to me. Because I can come up with, with examples who are dead and examples who aren't. <laughs> there have been two different people who wrote multi-volume biographies of George Washington, for Pete's sake. The books are thrilling to read. But... If you want to say, oh, well, scholarship of a certain time, the reading example of a certain time, you can't really use that against me. How about Simon Callow? He's not even a professional biographer. His multi-volume life of Orson Welles is never dull for even a minute. No, no, you can't say that it's not possible. All you can say is that when it came time for you to spill all of your index cards onto the page, you didn't think enough of your reader to think, well, I should shape this into a narrative. And that makes it bad. God, that makes you a bad author. <laughs> so, and unfortunately, the reason this is so big, this part of our quadratic equation here is so big, is because not only is this the market, this is the market, but also, I hate to say it, but it's undeniably true, this is what most people think about when they think about reading a biography. They'd never do it because they think it will be accurate but boring. Uh, and so they avoid it, and they avoid everything else as well. Or at the very least, if they want to read something to do with biography, but they don't want to risk reading something that's accurate but boring, then they'll read something at the bottom. They'll read inaccurate uh, and either boring. I would, I think that the Kitty Cali School of Biographies is boring, the racy kind of stuff. Uh, I think that's kind of boring, uh, but I guess that part of it is subjective. They'll... The, what I'm saying is biography, biography, people who want to read biographies who are afraid of encountering a gigantic iceberg of accurate but boring might resort to inaccurate and boring <laughs> uh, because it'll be racier, because it'll be more interesting. It's a terrible shame. It, the, the fact that biographies nowadays are expected by the, pu by the publishing industry, both mainstream and academic, to be accurate, and it's okay if it's boring. Because, you know, what am I supposed to do? Tap dance for you? Uh, the fact that that governs so much of what's out there makes the really good standout biographers all the rarer and is an accurate barometer of why people don't read this genre, <laughs> which is terrible. That's a terrible, terrible shame. Uh, and those are the different kinds of biographies that we will be encountering in April, in April, <laughs> we will be encountering these four kinds and whatever bleed through there is uh, for for any one of them. And this will this will be according to the three kinds of attribution that all biographies have, uh, where they are either uh, written by their subject, or they're written uh, about their subject by their biographer, or they're written about their subject by their biographer, <laughs> and, and it's it's actually an estate that's looking over their shoulder and controlling things. That's what that's what produces authorized lives and it's a terrible shame because I have sweet tooth for authorized lives, even though they are almost always fatally compromised. Because for every one estate that goes to its handpicked biographer and says, "Here are the archives. We're not gonna we're not gonna contact you at all. We this figure belongs to history. He was our uncle, but he belongs to history. We vetted you. You're you're a no nonsense historian. Go ahead. Here are the archives. That's it." Uh, for every one arrangement like that, there are a hundred arrangements where the family does care and where they are looking over your shoulder and you're only getting access to that archive if you dance to their tune, unfortunately, which makes authorized biographies a very parlous thing to read. Uh, and 
I love them anyway for that. I think there's a kind of art form involved because I don't believe, of course, if you are a commissioned biographer and fan, an estate comes to you and, and an artist's estate or author's estate or whatever, a politician's estate, and they make those kind of claims, the very first thing you should do is walk out the door. You should just say, okay, our original conversations on the subject said I would have a free hand. Now you're telling me I don't, so you're going to have to find somebody else. But biographers are only human. Writers are typically poor. <laughs> if there's money on the table, they will tend to keep that job. But that doesn't mean they're completely sacrificing their ethics. So a lot of times an author of an authorized biography will be doing little bits and pieces here and there, counting on the fact that the family or the estate will not be micro-reading every line. They just don't want scandal to come out. That's all. They don't want, they don't want you outing uncle as having a penchant for uh, pool boys or whatever. They, as long as it's clear with that, they won't micro-read every line, usually. And so I have found a great deal of game playing going on in a lot of official authorized biographies, although sometimes not, probably mostly not. Mostly it's just lying to the reader, uh, which would be, and they're also usually, they're usually big and stately things. So that would be boring and inaccurate. Uh, but I think almost all biographies fall somewhere on this chart. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to do my best to, uh, to go to either the accurate and interesting or the inaccurate and interesting. <laughs> so I'm going to do my best to stick to those. Because those are the only things. The interesting part is absolutely the kryptonite bullet. That's the only reason to read anything. Uh, so <laughs> I thought I would give you an overview of biographies before we start, we start getting down to cases in April. Because we're going to talk about biography all month long. Uh, I don't know what the first one that I will read for uh, people will be. But I will report back as soon as I know. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up for now. Uh, and I will see you then. Thank you, book two.